Hey everyone, welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. This week's been a busy week in the studio for me. I'm knee deep back working on the Calliope rock album stuff, and uh, it's awesome. Um, I'm really psyched. I've just been uh, recorded a ton of vocals, a lot of guitars. I got myself a little present, which was the Chase Bliss Audio Tonal Recall Analog Delay. And man, that thing just sounds amazing. So if you're a guitarist or you like guitar pedals, I would take a look because it's really amazing when a tool you get is even more inspiring than it is utilitarian. And that delay is one. It's, it's just magic. It's really fun. I'm doing a couple of gigs this weekend. On Friday, I'm in Dallas at the Nines, and then the next night on Saturday, I'm in Orlando playing the Married to the Rave Festival. This week is a little bit different on Tap Tempo. Michael Sundius, he's a recording artist under the name Rinzen and signed to Mousetrap, but he's also a contributor to both Billboard as well as Dancing Astronaut. He reached out a couple weeks ago asking if he could actually turn the microphone around on me, and I guess he actually wanted to conduct the interview on me this time. So this is basically that chat and it's personal, it's, it's intimate, and uh, pretty vulnerable. And it's really a snapshot of where I am personally right now. So thank you, Mike, for conducting this. So we're turning the microphone around on me this week. I've got Michael Sundius here from Dancing Astronaut and Billboard, and he graciously offered to, uh, he wanted to conduct an interview on me this time for the sake of the show. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand the microphone. Actually, he's got his own microphone. I'm just going to put the limelight onto Mike. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, so I've been a big fan of Matt for a few years now. Um, we originally got in touch when I wrote a little billboard feature about My Love Aside from Ephemera. Um, we've stayed in touch ever since, and from a personal standpoint, I've really enjoyed watching his career evolve, especially as he's gone down more of these left field routes, like um, his more techno influence productions to the more rock and industrial influence stuff now. And I started listening to his podcast when it came out and I'm a pretty avid consumer of podcasts in general and thought it might be interesting if we kind of turn the tables on Matt and um, had me interview him and kind of got more of his story and, um, I think the more interesting stuff for me too is because you know you can kind of find history and biography online, but I really wanted to know what's Matt's production process like, what are his daily routines like, um, where is he grabbing his inspiration from, you know, where where is he at in his career now? Um, so yeah, it, it kind of provided a, an opportunity for us to dive into all of that. I guess to start out, Matt, like, can we just get like a general life update on you like um how are you personally like how's the music going just you know how is everything it's good um on a personal level i'm the happiest i've probably ever been which is new for me and i'm not really sure entirely how to handle that yet so uh, i'm just taking it day by day but everything's good and that's weird <laughs> um musically uh, I'm stuck between two different worlds, or three different worlds, or four different worlds, as always. But um, trying to finish up a few more club records, and they're more, you know, techno based, and there'll be a three track techno EP. That two out of three are 100 percent done, and the third is 75. So it's close. I just need to say, you know, okay, I'm just going to finish two days or spend two days doing only that. But then I get distracted and. I don't. So uh, that's my own thing. I got to deal with that. But um, then I'm working on Calliope, of course, which is the next album, and trying to finish up the next EP for that. And that is, it was going to be another three track EP to, you know, that would flesh out basically half of what Calliope ultimately will be. But then I got inspired, and now there's a fourth track. And ideally, I want to do. Um, I want to spend all of next week doing all the vocals. Cool. And that's my goal. Whether that happens or not, I don't know because just life gets in the way. And then, of course, doing the podcast too has taken a lot of time away from actually just making music. So it's a it's a pretty delicate balance right now. And then gigging on weekends and you know being away. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a balance. 
Well, so I want to touch on something that you mentioned, the fact that you're kind of balancing these different worlds, these different genres. Um, is that more of like a recent thing you felt like where you've really been going deep into these, each of these separate worlds? Or is that kind of always been a consistent theme throughout your career, this kind of dabbling in different genres at once, kind of balancing these different worlds? It's certainly more public now than it ever was, but the amount of dabbling hasn't changed. I'm not going to be putting out a dubstep track anytime soon. I mean, I've done that. <laughs> you have? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I did a record. Uh, the I did, machine remix? No, well, that was kind of like, yeah, glitchy, yeah. whatever. But um, no, I mean, I had a dubstep track out on uh, Reed's Play Me Records a few years ago. Really? Yeah, and I put out a drum based record with her too, actually. Okay. Yeah, and it's actually just under my name, it's not an alias. Yeah. So, uh, Fair and Feral is, uh, that was, I mean, it's still kind of like, down tempo y drum and bass, but it gets pretty gnarly at times. Yeah, I remember that one actually. Yep. Yeah. So that was play me. Um, but I think I'm not going to put anything, just anything out these days. I'm a lot more precious about what I choose to put out because I'm also a lot more careful about how I want to represent myself musically. So it's definitely musically, it's two worlds. You know, you have the club thing, and mm-hmm. that's. Getting turned into an alias ultimately just to separate or make it, to be honest, uh, more cohesive. Because I do recognize when, like, you look at the name Matt Lang, it's a lot of like, what the fuck does he actually do? <laughs> because it's a lot of different things, and I understand that's confusing. So ultimately, like, the dance music thing will be filtered onto an alias. I'm just going to call it Isorhythm because I'm not hiding that it's me. It's just so if you see an Isorhythm record, you know what it's going to sound like. Mm-hmm. Whereas like right now, if you do that or you see a Matt Lang record, it's a bit of a gamble. Okay. And I like that. Yeah. But um, the business side of me knows that that's not always the wisest thing. Okay. So I'm splitting Matt Lang off ultimately to be. Um, you know, more the solo project thing, like the industrial rock, electronic, uh, whatever thing. And also uh, for, I guess, my composing career, if you will, where that way, you know, because I don't want to be DJing when I'm 40. I, I just don't. I want to mm-hmm. have a family. I want to have a life. I don't want to be gone every weekend. You don't want to be the next John Digweed? No. Um, I love John. Um, he's easily one of my favorite DJs, if not my favorite. But he is more of a DJ than I will ever be. I'm a musician Fair. first and foremost, and the reason why he's John Digweed is because his passion is DJing. And for me, I like it. It's fun. It pays my rent. But if it were like my last day on Earth, yep. would I choose to DJ? <laughs> Hell, fucking no. It's a great question. I would do honestly what I do every day, and I would just yeah. be like. Sitting in my studio with my cats and my guitars and like all the things, just playing something that meant something to me. Yeah, and that is that's it, you know. Sure. So the DJing is just another side, and really, it allows me to be able to do that. Where I mean, if getting paid to DJ allows me to spend days in my room without seeing a soul, yeah, because I'm not making money when I'm doing that. I'm doing it because, to be honest, I just have to do it. Yeah. You know, I love it. I'm. It's a compulsion. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting um, from an observer standpoint the, how deep you've gone into this more prog rock infused like metal influence kind of sound. And I know you've always been a fan of that kind of music and those kind of artists, but then you know it's particularly become really present in your music over just the past couple of years. Um, and I guess I want to know like how did that first come about? When did you make that decision that you were really going to start infusing those styles into your music? It's my roots. Simple as that. I mean, how I got into really electronic music and recording and production and all that was because I needed a way to facilitate making demos for my band. And that was like a hardcore punk, metal, whatever. It was blurry. But um, so that was always my thing. And then, you know, (laughs) I've snuck. Metal influenced things into records sure. every now and then. Even like uh, when I was doing Tanya Zagar's record, there's a moment in um, a track of hers called "Death of Me," and it has like a jump, jump, <laughs> like in there, <laughs> and just you know, there like there'd be little moments, you know, where I sure. would sneak it in. But 
I wasn't really in a position where I could do it full on. Okay. And I wasn't encouraged to do it either because just the way the industry works, you know, and when you have management and, you know, people who are, uh, they're looking at you from a business perspective and not so much an artistic perspective because that's ultimately what you pay them to do. That is their job. Um, when you have people telling you not to do that or discouraging that or, or not caring when you do, um, it wears on you, you know, and then you start to believe, you know, what they're saying and you just, I just had to do it. You know, I just, yeah. I had to for myself because this is, it's what I love, man. I mean, it's as simple as that. Like, I just, I want to pick up like my PRS, plug it through like some fucking guitar pedals and, just play because just the sheer joy of doing that. I don't get that from a computer. A computer is just a means to an end. It allows me to record and then I can, you know, do the stupid glitchy editing bullshit. But I just, I mean, it's something I was talking about with um, Brian Trifon. It was just that moment when, when you play a note and it just, it sends shivers up your spine. There's nothing that can replicate that for me. So now I'm at the point where, as opposed to just thinking, wouldn't it be great if I did that? But you know, what will they think? Or and I just, I stopped caring. I just decided, you know what, this is, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be as an artist. This is what I want to share of myself because it's the most personal music. Even going, you know, beyond lyrics and you know all that kind of emo bullshit, like, which. Like let's not kid ourselves. It's emotional. Like it's all relationship crap. So it's not as you know, wussy as dashboard. But not to say I don't love dashboard. I do. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, it's vulnerable music because it's. I'm certainly opening myself up emotionally, and I'm opening myself up to a lot of criticism. And it's not a safe route because. If it were a safe route, I would just make EDM, and that would be the worst thing I could ever do. But you know, it's easy, and and I mean like EDM, like EDM, EDM. The I'm not going to say names, but yeah, parentheses EDM. No, it's just this is what I. It's just an itch I had to scratch. Sure. Because if I didn't, it would have taken over my entire body, and I'd be like bleeding out on the floor or something yeah. awful. So <laughs> had to do it. Okay. Is there a specific um, moment in time that you kind of attribute to that change in your mind happening, or maybe a specific release that kind of signaled that shift? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not a release. Um, February of last year, um, I went through the worst breakup of my life, and it shattered me a hundred percent. And um, and in the wake of that, I wrote, I want to say, four or five of these like rock-ish tracks, and "Punish Me," which came out. You know, that was one of them. And that's when it's like I fell in love again. You know, not with a person, just with you know the process. And I remember then showing it to um, the people I had representing me at the time. And just like you know, this this is this matters. This is what I care about. And I mean, they they might not have understood you know the weight of what I was saying, and you know I can't blame them for that. But um, it was kind of just ignored, and that turned a few things later. But that turned into just me realizing you know what that this is a relationship I need to end because I need to be my own team. Right now, I just need to consolidate everything because the only way I'll be able to like achieve what I want to achieve is without anyone standing in my way. And because there are plenty of people standing in your way, no matter what you do, but I can't have my own team standing in my way. And it's not their fault. You know, they're looking after what's best for them and what they think is best for me. And I'm a little masochistic. I know that. Like, I, I will, you know, run the fucking cheese grater over my arm to feel something. So, proverbially, not literally, but. Um, but that was the turn of everything. 
So I do credit that woman for um, for pushing me in a place I never would have gone to necessarily, or it would have taken me longer to get there. And that was that was the turning point. That's when everything kind of fell into perspective of where I want to be as an artist, who I want to be as a person, and what are the steps I have to take to achieve that. Sure. In many ways, it's almost a new era of your career. Um, I don't know if you look at it this way, but from my perspective, I kind of see uh, the Anjuna Deep Matt Lang, who then evolved out of that and you know went to Mousetrap. And then now you're doing all these more live-centric projects. You're incorporating your vocals a lot. And it kind of is this this new version of yourself. Um, but, and I guess my question is, do you, do you segment your career like that? When you look back on it, do you see it in these stages kind of leading up to now? Or how, how do you view it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's not really a conscious decision to segment it off like that. I just think that naturally happens. I think everyone goes through different periods. Everyone's got to have their blue album. Um I just look at it as different moments in my life. Simple as that. During the Anjuna days, that was pretty much almost immediately post BT. And I had just gotten out of, you know, that world and I was trying to find my footing in the dance music world a bit and just, you know, by connections and uh Andrew Bear being, you know, an amazingly close friend, that was an opportunity that just opened its door to me. And I followed it. You know, there was no reason not to. You know, opportunity knocks, say hello. So I did. And five years go by. And I just wasn't feeling it anymore. I mean, my. I started towards the end of my tenure doing the Anjuna thing, I started DJing a lot more. And all credit where credit's due, that is entirely due to Anjuna. As I started to DJ more, I discovered what kind of records I like to spin. And it wasn't the kind of records I was making for Anjuna because I just I, I was bored when I would DJ them, and I found myself gravitating more towards the techno records where you could layer them on top of each other and almost be more improvisational during a set. So I started making more of those, and Anjuna wasn't really into that at the time, which is um, Lane Eight hadn't even happened yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was 2013, sure. 14. Um, yeah, it was actually almost four years ago. So they were still doing the more, um, I guess, uplifting, proggy thing. And I just started making these other records. Um, a different breakup, <laughs> since the pattern here. Um, a different breakup spurred, there she goes, literal, and, uh, and falling into place. And I put those were actually the first two like club records I put out in ISO rhythm. And as those were about to come out, that's when the whole mousetrap thing happened. And it was funny because at the time I was saying, like, all right, well, I'm just gonna use ISO rhythm for everything now because I mean I can't seem to sign a record anywhere and it's just not what I want. So I just need to be able to do my own thing and then coincidentally, you know, Joel and Mousetrap just Okay, do music with us now. So I did. And uh, Scorched Earth Policy came out first, and that was written in that gloom of the There She Goes era. Uh, I was really angry at the time. <laughs> really angry, which is why that record is so dark. And then um, then I guess they, they ultimately optioned me to do an EP. And I pulled a bait and switch. And I gave them an album instead, and it wasn't. It was like for the same, you know, advance money for an EP. It was just, nope, you're going to put out an album instead, and they're not going to say no because they got to spend the same amount of money to put out a whole album as opposed to an EP. Sure. And then credit to them, they're the ones who said, you know what, let's do it on vinyl, and let's do physical, and that was yes, this is going to be amazing. And then because a, I've always wanted my own. Like not being on a physical compilation, but I wanted my own, you know, and that, that's an ego thing. But still, it's just it's an accomplishment, and I've always wanted it. So I was really into the idea, and then on top of it, um, at the time, Mousetrap was still distributed under Capital, and what allowed me to move out to LA 
five years ago, I got a publishing deal with Warner Chapel, which is Warner's publishing arm. And there was this stipulation in my contract that for me to fulfill the contract, I had to have uh, a number of release tracks on a major label CD. And doing this album would then knock me entirely out of my Warner contract. Except a week before the album came out, Mousetrap went independent. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> and that's a whole that's a longer story. But um, but no, and then Mousetrap just ultimately they gave me an avenue just to release basically anything. I mean, everything had to be semi dance floor oriented, which makes sense. But I would just find ways to work around that where I'd. You know, Ephemera had seven club tracks maybe on it, and then four not. And then two were just like ambient interlude things. And then I had two full on basically me tracks and like lying to myself and inside my head. Like, I don't look at the club tracks as me tracks. Those are just club tracks. Interesting. Yeah. But lying to myself inside my head. And then when you go to um, patchwork and, you know, consider this and uh, empty walls. Yeah, those are the me tracks. And that was. Every time I do a record like that, that's where I feel at home. That's when I feel most purely myself. So I just found ways to do it. And that was by basically, you know, <laughs> encircling them with club records. And yeah. that was my way I could get them out. Yeah. But that, that's interesting to me. You have that division in your mind about club records versus non club records. Because for one, you're pretty damn good at making club records. But um, you treat them kind of coldly and almost as this uh, auxiliary part of your pr- your process. But um, you're damn good making it, them, and like um, uh, it's interesting to me that you almost don't hold so much value to them as like your other work. And I guess where do, where do you think that comes from, and why do, why does that division exist for you? I feel zero emotional connection. It's purely utilitarian. Um, and now when I make club records. They are ultimately to fill spots in my sets, and I'll be looking at like my tractor playlist and realizing I need a kind of like mid energy track and G sharp minor to segue in between these two keys. Like so, that's how I look at it now because a club record to me is no longer about just the record. Yeah, it's about the DJ set, and it's changed how I write records, at least those kind of records, certainly. Because they ultimately become tools for a bigger picture, and that bigger picture is playing a two-hour set. Sure. But do you think there's ways to kind of reconcile those two parts of you? Because, I mean, I've definitely heard it in your sound where you're bringing in these more live or industrial elements Mm -hmm. into your techno compositions. So, I mean, I I feel like there's not always such a polarized division in your sound. No, I mean, I'm always going to, there are going to be parts of me in any record I do, be it a jazz record, be it a club record, be it a rock record. I mean, I am me. No matter what I touch, it's going to have my stamp on it. Um, but it's easy to do. It doesn't challenge me. And I think that's part of the reason why I feel less of a connection to it. Um, it, it just, they're never made to stand on their own. Because also, when I find when you make a track that's supposed to completely stand on its own, it limits what you can do with it in a DJ set. Yeah. And when I'm doing a DJ set, I don't plan them or anything like that. It's it's off the cuff. The only thing I'm doing right now is like opening with uh, all you need to see because yeah. I made an intro mix for it, and you know the tour is called that and everything. But um, they're not meant to be individual compositions on their own. They all ultimately. I, in my mind, are tools for a bigger picture. Sure, more utilitarian, as you said. Yeah. Um, interesting thing to me is, yeah, like with your new tracks, they're kind of blending these two worlds, um, but they really have this really strong techno foundation, and I think a lot of that kind of comes from the new gear you've picked up along the way. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear more. About from a technical standpoint, how your creative process has changed over the years, and kind of how that's influenced the records you've made. Um, for instance, before Ephemera, I know you got really into modular, and that kind of just flipped your entire process on its head. Um, possibly before that too. So I'd be curious to know 
how the modular fascination came about, if there have been other any other big more technical changes that have in turn kind of changed your entire sound. So the funny thing is the way I work now is not too dissimilar from how I started. Where back then it was, you know, it was a guitar plugged into a Behringer V amp, which was like a Line 6 pod guitar amp emulator, and just running that directly into my laptop's mic in. And that's how I um, I really got into music production, was basically starting outside the box, recording it in, and then editing it. And then when I went to Berkeley, I got really in the box. Suddenly I was exposed to C sound and SoundTac and all these DSP platforms of where you can manipulate sounds and ways I could never even imagine. And so then for really a solid four years, I was so in the box all the way. And towards the end of my time at Berkeley, I started really playing guitar again and started incorporating that in. And then when I worked with BT, we used a lot of real instruments. And that was done more in a fashion of the way I work now, where you take a lot of things from outside the box and you record real instruments or found sound, whatever, and then it gets digitally manipulated and ends up in the blender somewhere. And fast forward 10 years later after that, and now I'm almost where I started again, (laughs) in a way where everything is starting outside, be it an instrument, be it a synth, but it all is, you know, it's, it's being played, it's being touched, and it's being plucked, and then it just ends up now it's Pro Tools, and you know, then it gets very finely edited, and you know, all the production tricks. But it's, um, yeah, it's really not that different. Now it's just on a much higher level because it's 17 years later. But the modular thing that happened, it started happening about. Three, three, four years ago. And I remember when it first came around, and it, uh, I kind of avoided it because I knew it was expensive. And I was just like, well, why do that when I have all this stuff on the computer? Which it's a cop out, but I'm aware. And then my buddy Anthony Baldino came over and he's just like, no, I'm going to show you what it's like. And he brought over these two little cases he had at the time. And Within minutes of just plugging a few things in and touching it, it was just one of those. I looked over, it was like, I need this. I understand now. You were right. And that was it. Um, And then I got a really small case from Make Noise first. And it was just super basic. It had like an oscillator, a filter, um, a VCA, and an envelope. And then I got a, a MIDI module just so I could, you know, connect it to my computer. And that. That changed how I certainly was making tech now, yeah. because um, suddenly I could get my ideas not by clicking around, which I find very uninspiring in general, but I could just play basically on my synth, and I could find tonalities and textures and percussive patterns and you know all sorts of things that I wouldn't necessarily create digitally. And it's not something I could do with a guitar or a piano. I mean, this is a whole it's a whole different world. So it was just it was another tool that ultimately grew to be a much bigger tool. And I these days I treat the modular like I treat any other instrument. You know, it's a piano is a piano, and that's gonna inspire you to do certain things. A guitar is gonna inspire you to play a different way than you would a piano. The modular is gonna inspire me to work in a different way than I would if I were playing a traditional instrument, if you will, the same as you know, singing a melody. I will. I mean, I do that a lot, actually. Like, I mean, it's. I think I was taught this at Berkeley. Is you know, when you're trying to write a melody, sing it first, mm-hmm. um, which I find helpful. Um, so really, I mean, I just like to have as many different um, instruments and colors in my palette because. The way I paint with red is drastically different than blue. Sure. And then, so when you're starting a song, do you have a general idea of um, which instrument you want to start with, or is it more you might pick up an instrument, start jamming, an idea kind of sprouts, and you build from there? 
Half and half. Um, or not even half and half. I'd say more often than not, a track begins because I've been playing something. And you know, I just get that inspiration of, oh, I better record this. This sounds really cool, whatever. And then you know, then you build around that. When it's a techno track, that usually starts with drums. Usually, sometimes it starts with like a weird sound I made on the modular or something. Because then again, you can get really inspired by just interesting sound design, and the modular is amazing for that. And um, that'll do that. But there are moments when it's been preconceived, certainly. And I think inside my head was like that. Certainly. Um, and the funny thing is, like, even if you have this opus built in your head, you're never going to execute it as you hear it. Yeah. And you actually can get really frustrated because you want it to sound like it is in your head. Sure. But translating that, even like no matter how good you are, I mean, I think it's, you know, your brain's lying to you also. <laughs> but, <laughs> how so? Well, I think your brain is imagining things that. Physically, you can't necessarily figure out how to do, okay. and maybe that's my own incompetence. But um, every time I hear something in my head, I mean, some if it's really simple, there are moments where I can you know nail it a hundred percent. But when I hear a lot more orchestration, when I actually get down to the point of putting the pen down to the paper, it never comes out the same. Not necessarily worse; it's just not the same. And then you know, I'll be in the shower thinking like, "Fuck." <laughs> <laughs> How important do you think it is to kind of um, maintain that original inspiration and kind of uh, work off of that versus being open to the possibilities of anything that might come up along the way? Like, do you keep that original you have to be idea to in the back of your mind? Sure, but in the back. Yeah. Um, no, I think you have to be open to anything in really all walks of life, be it making music, being it taking a stroll down the park. Um, if it works, it works. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. If you're blocking yourself because it doesn't, you know, this isn't what it was supposed to be, you're just holding yourself back. So embrace it if something comes in. See what happens. What's your process of creation like? Um, like, when do you find yourself getting inspired? Um, are you doing certain activities to kind of fuel your inspiration? Um, just give us a sense of your creative process. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the inspiration just hits, but when you do this every day, it's not like you know you get hit with Cupid's arrow every morning. <laughs> um, no, you just do the work. You sit down and you write, or you produce, or make whatever you want to call it. You just you sit down and you do the work. And along the way, you'll find the inspiration. But there's that whole thing, you know, the last 10% takes 90% of the time. I mean, that's true. You know, you'll get the initial idea out quickly. If it's good, you'll want to finish it. There are lots of ideas you don't finish. That's part of the process. But you just do it, you just work. Sure. I've always kind of viewed um, two camps of creativity. I think there's the people who think you should only work when you're inspired, and you know they'll kind of go on with their day when they're not inspired. And then when that moment comes, they'll rush to their pen or to the studio. And then there's the other people who really believe that, like, if you're sitting there disciplined every day, you're almost opening the door for creativity to well, come in. And, and you're, you said it right there. Yeah, it's a discipline. Yeah, I think it's easy for it to be a hobby if you just wait. But you're not actually getting anything done. You know, you could be lying to yourself by saying, "Oh well, I don't feel it today, so I'm going to watch six movies." Okay. Well, imagine all the possibility you're missing out on. Instead of you know messing around, killing time, or whatever, waiting for inspiration to hit, you could actually just be trying to ignite it. Sure. And you will. You just have to do it. So, do you not experience writer's block? No, I do. Of course, I do. Everyone does. I just find ways to work around it. If I, you know, if I'm working on a track or something and nothing's making sense or whatever, I'll close that project. I know I'm not going to force that, but maybe I'll start working on something different. Maybe I'll pick up an instrument. Maybe I'll 
open up a different track. And even if nothing nothing concrete comes out of that, that doesn't mean I lost a day. It means I tried a bunch of options that I know I don't need to ever do again. So I'm always gaining something from it, even if I do have writer's block. The other side is you can always just like fuck around and do sound design. Yeah. Because inevitably you will get inspired by some weird kooky thing you just made in any given way. Like Brian was talking last night about one of his like most used sounds is the recording of an oven door. And it's all over his last album. So it's like if you're locked if you're lost and you know you can't you just can't finish that track you're working on for whatever reason, you just, you've hit the wall. I mean, I find just sticking microphones in front of things, you know, and odd sounds and found sounds and field recording. Yeah, you'll get some cool ideas out of that. Like ideas you'll never get just by looking at a computer screen or looking on like Splice or whatever the sample websites people use. Just go out and do it. It's so much more personal too. What does a typical day of creating and making music look like for you? Are you generally starting at a certain time? Are there any rituals that you're doing before or during the process to kind of yeah. start the creativity? Yeah, I have a system. Um, I usually get up at about 8.30 and I make coffee and then I read a book for about, I try to do, I don't know, not a lot, just like 20, 30 pages just to Mm kind of get my brain working while I'm waking up with coffee. And um, then I'll sit down and then I'll work for three hours or so. And in between there I'll have some kind of breakfast, but half the time breakfast is just coffee. And then if it's if I have more free time on my hands, or not free time, but I can, you know, I'm not obligated to anybody else but myself, then I'll go skating or skateboarding for an hour or two or whatever. And then, you know, that ends up taking three hours between getting ready to go and stretching. And I always do yoga beforehand too, so I don't hurt myself any more than I already have. So um let's say I go out at, you know, noon or one, I'm back working around four. And then I'll work until I cook dinner. And depending on whether I'm seeing anybody that night or not, I might just keep working after that. And sometimes I'll go till two o'clock in the morning and sometimes I'll stop working at eight and I'll cook dinner and just, you know, watch a movie and go to sleep. But that's that's pretty much the outline of the day to day. How important do you think it is to kind of have that set time where you know you're going to create every single day, regardless of if you're inspired or not? I think it's productive. I think it's healthy. I know myself well enough to know that I work, I do, even though I fight it, I do work best when I do have at least a little bit of a schedule, because otherwise I'll just get lost in my own world. So just for the sake of, um, my own accountability to my work. I need to structure it in a way that, you know, I can be productive, but at the same time I can have personal time for myself and feel feel accomplished at the end of the day. Simple as that. Sure. Um how did your routine come about? Um was there other points in your life where maybe your process was a little bit more frantic? And it was more just producing at any moment you got. Um, have you always had this kind of rigorous schedule to your creativity? I would say it's the most disciplined now. Um, if we went back a year, the process wasn't that different, um, but it just wasn't as scheduled. It was like I didn't have like my coffee and book routine in the morning or and I was waking up at 10 as opposed to 8:30 and I might just, you know, mess around for a few hours and then I'm going to go skate now and like ah shit it's 5 p.m. I haven't even started working yet. Oh, I better start doing that. Yeah. Oh, well I got lost in that. Fuck. Well, I guess I didn't work today. Yeah. You know, I, I don't let that happen. Like now I choose to let that happen because I need it to. Yeah. But um I would say the turning point was when my schedule became certainly more disciplined was part of the whole transition that I was talking about with last year 
and then ultimately, you know, getting rid of my own management and having to run everything, all sides of my business, except basically booking gigs, which thankfully I have an awesome agent now. But um, before that, I was doing that too, and so just doing everything myself forced me to evaluate my choices and my day to day as far as what was good for me, what would I feel good about myself doing, and. If I allowed myself to be lazy, which is really easy to allow, or at least for me to allow myself to be, um, I would be pretty unhappy with myself at the end of the day. And then I would drink too much or whatever, and then I'd feel worse about it the next morning. And it's such you know a negative spiral sure. to kind of allow yourself to feel that way. So I just... I just decided to make the changes in my own life to facilitate my own happiness, really. And I, I decided, you know, my what my bliss is is being able to make music during the day, go skateboarding, see a girl at night, like that. That's the bliss I want to follow. So now I've just structured my life in ways that I can do that. Sure, it's almost like that concept where you work on improving one aspect of your life and it ends up benefiting all the others. Oh yeah, everything's sympathetic. Yeah, Absolutely. Like I, I almost feel like this new rigorous discipline creative process of yours is almost indicative of your larger life kind of gaining like a new structure. It is. Um, and it's fun. I actually I have to credit Tim Ferriss really? with a lot of it. Um, cuz he put out that book Tools of Titans. Mhm. Last year, and I got it right when it came out in December. And I just, I mean, that's the fastest I've ever read a Harry Potter book, or a fucking eight. <laughs> that's the fastest I've ever read an 800 page book short sure. of a Harry Potter sure. book. And that said, I never actually read, I read the first three Harry Potters. Yeah. I didn't read any more after that. But, and those were like 400 pages. But shit, I did like one of those in a day. That was okay. impressive. But, um, but yeah, I did like an 800 page book in two weeks, which wow. for me, that's, you know, yeah. Really fast. Sure. Usually I do because just the way I structure my time, like I'll do you know like a hundred pages a week or something yeah. like that. But you know it's not my job. It's just something I do because I feel like it benefits me. But um, yeah, reading the Tools of Titans thing, where you had all the interviews with all the various entrepreneurs and you know other musicians, artists. I mean, it's a really comprehensive guide of the way people structure their lives and you know. Systems of their own success and everything like that, and um, I got a lot of inspiration out of that, certainly, and also it, in a way rewired my brain also to be more entrepreneurial. And I mean, I, that's quite honestly how this whole podcast came to be was yeah. in that period. And listening to Tim Ferriss, listening to a lot of Mark Maron, I really, I really like Mark's work a lot. And um, that was really where a lot of the structure or, or the inspiration to structure my life more effectively came to be. Sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Tim's podcast as well. Um, are there other figures in your life that you, you credit to making these changes or that have become good role models in the past year? Well, it's not in the past year, but my parents are my biggest role models. Usually, um, they're both they're independent artists, self-employed their entire careers. So um, I'm fortunate to have grown up in that upbringing and you know have their support. And I mean, I it's funny now. I'm <laughs> as an adult, I'm 31 now, and I feel I'm the closest to them that I've ever been. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. So that matters a lot to me. Um, other people I look up to, um, I really admired Maynard Keenan. Yeah, Tool. Um, Tool, Pussifer, all the above. Um, just his, uh, aside from his artistic side, his, I appreciate his outlook on the world and the whole do it yourself, learn to fish kind of attitude. You know, or learn to swim, I should say, ultimately, but learn to fish also. Um, I looked up to them a lot. Then, I mean, there are, of course, other musicians. Like, uh, I mean, hybrid are huge for me. 
Um, I really respect how they've treated their careers, what they do now. Telephone Tel Aviv, um, I mean, a big part of why I make music the way I do is because of Josh and Charlie. Um, Richard Devine, also. And then you have the rock guys, like, um, I mean, in high school, which was a really pivotal time for me musically as far as my taste. That's like when I discovered Tool and got to Aphex Twin around that time. But um, certainly Nine Inch Nails. That the way I make, the way I do records is not the same process. I mean, I don't have a team of people around me, but um, taking away the process from it and looking at the overall product at the end, that is... Um, that's always a reference to me. Like I just I listen to the fragile as you know a good guide of, especially because w- what Nine Inch Nails did so well was the way they were able to combine synthetic and acoustic instruments as well as songwriting and you know s- say what you will about you know everyone has their own opinions on Trent's voice or lyrics or whatever but it it fits you know it it fits what it's trying to say so perfectly and. Yeah, the fragile is. It's one of my favorite records of all time. Um, like the fragile lateralis and like yeah. map of what's effortless and like I'm happy, you know, <laughs> like I'm done. But um, I would say also what I admire about Trent Reznor a lot these days is the way his career has evolved. Um, it's a career path that. I would really like for myself. Not so much, I mean, the Apple beats music yeah. entrepreneurial thing. I mean, ultimately that happens when you're well known anyway because you get the opportunity and you're foolish not to take it. But, I mean, like he said in a recent interview, he realized after doing the tech thing and flying up to San Fran every week that he just wanted to make music. Yeah. And, like, if that's what you're born to do, that's what you have to do. But the way he, um, Transitioned basically from Nine Inch Nails into his film scoring career, and I love the film scores he writes. Yeah, I really do, and they're different. And I don't, I don't feel very connected to the more traditional Hans Zimmer esque film scores. Interesting. Why is that? It's too in your face. Okay. Um, I've always been drawn to music that is a little bit more melancholy and. Allows how you're supposed to feel be more up to your own interpretation. Okay. Um, I think that's why, like, my favorite film composer, like, I love uh, Cliff Martinez's work yeah. um, because, like, the Solaris score is just, oh my god, you know, that's it's beautiful, but it, it's melancholy, and I think that's a big part of um, why a lot of Joel Dead Mouse's early records were so successful. Like, if you listen to Faxing Berlin, oh yeah, you know, random album title, yeah, yeah. like there's. There's a melancholy in there that isn't entirely deceiverable. Mm-hmm. It's you can kind of place your own emotion onto it the same way if you listen to a lot of Tool's lyrics. They're vague but immediately relatable because you can find a way to apply your own life onto the meaning of those songs and that's ultimately how a song becomes your favorite song because you internalize it and it it creates that emotional bond within you that matters um so that's always been my favorite kind of music and you know the thing with some of like the more big movie film scores um big brass dabs and string yeah. swells and you know like it, it fits them all it's kind of obvious. Well, it's obvious, you know, and yeah. and like when you're those composers, also, you know, they're getting hired to do a specific role. Sure. You know, no one's hiring you to do Iron Man five, so you make a dark ambient score. Yeah. You know, it needs to support the movie, and yeah. I understand that. You know, it's everything has its place, but that's uh, what I'm drawn to is not that. I almost see a parallel in the EDM world where it's like that main stage world of, you know, they're kind of telling you very directly what to feel, when to jump. Oh yeah. They literally yeah. tell you when to jump. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't make it more obvious. No. Yeah. But that crowd needs it sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's lowest common denominator music. Yeah. When it comes to like the festival EDM thing. And you have to look at what the fan base is. Mm-hmm. 
And it's a lot of people there who are just to party. They want to let go. They most likely are on some kind of substance or combination thereof. Or just wasted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a briefer way to say that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so people, you know, people are messed up. They want to let yeah. go. They want to have fun. And EDM isn't challenging music. Yeah. There is zero challenge, especially when the guy is telling you to jump. That's pop music. Pop music isn't challenging either. Yeah. If it were challenging, it wouldn't be pop. Yeah. Because it has to make you feel good instantly. That is the ultimate goal of it. That's why EDM exists the way it does. And that's why they can, you know, get stupid amounts of money for headlining an EDC festival or whatever, because you have fifty thousand people in front of you who want to feel that way. Yeah. And to your point though, I mean a lot of those people Maybe they're just getting away for the weekend. They aren't necessarily as deeply rooted in the scene, so they're not necessarily looking for something deeper out of it. No, I, I, yeah. I don't think anyone goes to an, a festival like that looking for something deeper out of it. Yeah, I think they're going to that, you know, because they want to escape. They want to feel wild. They want to, sure. you know, feel kind of some kind of ecstasy that they're not feeling in other parts of their lives. So that festival exists because that provides that for them. I mean, it, it's simple supply and demand, and that's yeah. why. They are so strong. At least some of them, like the Insomniac festivals, are huge. Totally, but yeah. they're well run. Yeah, there are a lot of festivals that collapsed because they just weren't, or they left people trying to sleep in the gutter. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's just bad business. <laughs> but I think your point about Trent taking it back to that was kind of that he's had that evolution where, you know, he he eventually got into this whole world of film composition and. He's aged very well, per se. Mm -hmm. Um, He's still very well respected. He's still able to headline as Nine Inch Nails at festivals around the world, yet he's able to score these big films. Um, So I'd love to hear more about your vision of your growth over, let's say, the next 10 years, the kind of things you'd want to be doing, Mm -hmm. how you want to be perceived over the next decade. Yeah, um, ultimately I want to end in film. I mean, I'll always be putting out my own music, you know, just because... I have to, not for anybody. I just have to for myself. But um, the other side of my career is, yeah, I, I want to. I mean, that's a big part of why I live in LA. Films here, create creative people are here. Um, I don't really know what else is going to happen because I've always kind of thought a plan is just basically a list of shit that doesn't happen. So I've stopped making plans. Which drives some people I know kind of nuts, but I just don't. Yeah, I, I just this is like the plans I have are like I know where I'm supposed to be on certain weekends for gigs because those are set in stone. You know, those are you know promises to people. Yes, I'm going to show up in Chicago to do this, but for the rest of my life because I already have my own schedule, I, I can't commit really to anything unless it really matters to me. So I could say, yeah, I'm, I want to be scoring the, I get Christopher Nolan's Batman 5000, which is never going to happen because he's never going to do another Batman. But like, that's the yeah. Batman I'd want, you know? Sure. But, um, but I don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. Yeah. I know I'll certainly be creating. I know that. That's, you know, there's no question about that. But, um, I would love to work more in film from the work I've had in it so far because I just I like the challenge of it and psychologically I'm really fascinated by the emotional manipulation of it and the way contextualizing any scene with your music completely changes an audience's perception of the scene that to me is so powerful and so fascinating from you know you could have the same visual in front of you and ultimately the musical bed you put behind that could make them feel joyous or fill them with anxiety and despair that to me is so powerful and it's kind of like almost like the pinky in the brain evil scientist in me like <laughs> look what i can do to you yeah. you know but um it's really fascinating to me yeah, I was going to ask um, 
just about that, yeah. What what compels you, do you think, to want to have that effect on people to be able to frame the scene like that and get that reaction? Like, um, where do you think that comes from? And like, has that drive kind of grown over time? Do you think it's probably a need for control, most likely. Um, it's what makes you a good producer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really picky. Um, for better or worse. I hold a really high standard of myself, which ultimately uh, I transpose that onto other people and then usually end up feeling disappointed because it's not fair to hold my own standard for myself on other people because other people are themselves, which hence my problems. But uh, (laughs) no, um, I like the power of that and that is certainly an ego thing. You know, being able to feel that you've affected people in that way or craving, desiring to be able to do that. And maybe that stems from, you know, feeling unwanted when you're younger. I think most, most musicians, most artists probably had a, a harder upbringing. Um, not, or, or just usually, you know, feeling like outcasts, you know, and I think a natural, and the and the the funny thing too is you know if you're at a level where you're getting recognition it's probably because you were an outlier in some degree so then because you were you were probably chastised when you were younger for being that way just cuz kids are terrible <laughs> you know, they are absolutely terrible to each other but Again, socially, it's really fascinating to watch because, you know, without them knowing it, they're trying to thin the herd. I mean, it's essentially survival of the fittest. But, I, I mean, I got to love that nerds rule the world now. You know, that, the irony of that is yeah. amazing. But um, consequently, I just, I think everyone, or not everyone, that, that wouldn't be fair to say. But I think a certain number of us, if you felt if you felt unvalued when you were younger, and now you have this power to feel valued because you have basically all this social affirmation from people all over the world, there is a little bit of a vindictive streak in you. Sure. And it's not healthy. And it certainly doesn't benefit anybody, and it's totally ego-driven. But sometimes it really feels good just to fucking say, fuck you. (laughs) Yeah. It really does. You know, it's like all this shit you put me through, well, fuck you. Look where I'm at now. And I know that's not the right thing to do. Yeah. But it feels good. <laughs> you know, and that's the battle right there. And that that's that's the ego battle, you know, just to put that aside and, you know, realize you don't have to do that. I think the fact that you're acknowledging it is one an important step. I think a lot of artists wouldn't necessarily never kind of uncover that from their psyche and just be content to kind of pretend that wasn't a thing or that's not where they're drawing a lot of their drive from. Um and, and like you said, it, it is a constant battle. Because you're you're constantly in the public eye, and especially as you start to gain success, um, in some respects, you know that that struggle is only going to get worse as you get bigger. Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly seen it. You know, people who I've worked with who are you know violently more sure. well known, and and I would never want to be that because I see how reclusive they become. So how do you how do you transcend that feeling of vindictiveness and that ego feeling? Because um, obviously it's it's deeply ingrained in our childhoods, as you said. Um, but do you have methods where you're able to to separate yourself from that and kind of enter a more pure creative state? I suppose. Well, I don't think about it all the time. Yeah, I, I don't really think about it very often at all, to be honest. Yeah. Just you know, when it comes up and you think about it, it's like, oh, you bastard. But um, no, I think I think the healthiest thing is just to think about ignoring everything on the periphery and remembering what it is that you care about. 
And it most likely, what you care about isn't hurting somebody else because then it's not about you. Like, what do you actually want to do? And that is, that's where the gold is. You know, that's, that's certainly where I find, where I find peace and what I'm doing is when I'm expressing what's true to me, what I'm experiencing. And I think a listener base, they respond to that. They connect to that in an emotional way because they can find themselves within it. I've almost noticed too, just um, as a consequence of you kind of having this artistic awakening, pursuing um, more music that's more genuine to your actual tastes, it, it kind of has been reflected in your personality as well with how you communicate with your fans. For instance, even just starting the podcast, but I've also noticed you're doing a newsletter pretty consistently now. Um, even just with how you're communicating with fans, um, it just, yeah, it, it seems like a more conscious decision to have that genuine conversation with your fans and kind of open yourself up more. Um, do, yeah. do you feel that? Have you experienced that? No, no. I mean, it was a, it was like you said, it was a conscious decision. Absolutely. Um, this doing this podcast was a very conscious decision into realizing that um, I needed. Not that I needed friends, but I needed more of a, a life. I needed connection to people. And this was an opportunity to do that because it's easy for me to stay in my studio hole and not see anybody. Totally. That is so easy. And LA is an isolating city. It's very easy to isolate yourself within it. So it was one of those things I just I had to make a choice just for my own sanity. That you know what, it would be really healthy for me to communicate, and in a lot of different ways. And I mean, I know certainly in the relationship that spawned a lot of you know the changes in my life, um, a lot of the issues were communication based. So part of the whole, I guess. Um, the hereafter of that was embracing or trying to embrace more effective communication. And one of the ways that manifested was being more open about my life with, I guess, really the public. And it's interesting. Um, And it's also, it's not purely just communication via newsletters. I started doing that regularly because I know how to vehicle to do it. Um, like totally from you know like don't get me wrong you know this podcast that's a business decision 100% you know that is this is a vehicle for me to be talking to people on a weekly basis and on top of that just it's a little manipulative but i get to expose i get to expose myself to other people's fan bases very easily and I mean it's it's calculated, you know, it it's very it's very calculated, but it was a need just to communicate. Simple as that. And finding validation in community, especially when it's so easy to feel completely alone. So that is where the newsletter and the opening myself up and you know being a lot more vulnerable to the public I obviously don't say everything, you know. I keep, I still, for the most part, keep my personal life off of all kind of media because nothing good really ever ever sure. ends with anyone putting their personal life on social media. It's online forever at that point. Well, not even that, but like, have something for yourself. Yeah, true. Like, say I were pregnant, which is a funny image. <laughs> I'm picturing I, it. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's bizarre, <laughs> but you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger did it first, okay. so it's possible. It. I'm not going to have twins; I'll just have one. Okay, but you don't uh, control that. I control it. <laughs> control freak. Remember? Yeah. No. <laughs> um, but I would never be like posting pictures of like, here's myself at one month, here's myself at two months. You know, 
like I I just don't want the attention of that. You know, sure. I mean, I, I'm I'm very picky and choosy about what I what I put of myself out into the ether, and um, it's very safe just to. Just to put career stuff, it's very safe, of course, and to put like tech things, and I like this gear or whatever. Like, there's no vulnerability to that really at all. So I've tried to find ways of imparting more of myself into it, while at the same time keeping a fair amount of privacy. Sure, I'm thrilled to share with people who I am, but I don't want them knowing what I'm doing all the time. I I need that for me. Yeah, yeah. Would you say this vulnerability, though, this opening up, has been a contributing factor to your overall happiness? Because you did mention oh, you've been in a much better place lately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like a weight off my shoulders, you know, and just not having to keep things bottled up. Or, and I think a big part of that too is not having to have a filter to pass things through, as in people to do that PR or management, whatever. It's just for the way. I am as an artist, and this doesn't work for everybody. Some people work really well with a team. I just don't play well with others. <laughs> I, I've just learned that about yeah. myself. I just don't. So, why do you think that is? Just it comes back to the control aspect. Probably. Yeah. Probably. I mean, like, I just want to do my own thing. Okay. Always. And the minute someone says you shouldn't do that, be for this reason. Then I just naturally resent them for it, and I don't know if it's necessarily like a spoiled kid thing because I wasn't spoiled, and I have like I have a brother. It's not like I'm an only kid or anything like that, but I just feel like I need to be on my own path always. And if my path, you know, happens to run parallel to your path, you know, for a moment in time, cool, you know, like. We'll have a beer on our, you know, parallel trains, and you know, high five each other or whatever. But the minute my path starts to veer to the left, like it's not personal. I don't have anything against you. I just have to go do this because this is what I have to do. And that kind of just, I think, the simple acceptance of that, and maybe that's you know a bit of self centeredness, but. There's. No one I need to please other than myself right now. So why should I worry about anybody else? Like, my bills are paid. My cats eat good tuna. Like, <laughs> that is the only real contributing factors and, you know, things outside of myself right now. So why should I concern myself with things that have nothing really to do with me? So given this whole new self-awareness, which has become really evident, um, and this kind of new phase of your career, I mean... It I'll almost... probably think it's all hubris in like two <laughs> years. Like, Don't get me wrong, this is going to be the... Yeah, you're like, fucking... I thought I knew everything at 31, but I actually knew nothing. No, yeah. I know I know shit. Yeah. But in, <laughs> at 33, I'll know I still don't know shit. So. <laughs> but it almost feels like you've taken the control back into your hands... And especially with this new entrepreneurial drive, it almost feels like you have the power now to create your next step and kind of build whatever it is you want to build. Um, is that how you feel? That's the dream. Yeah. That's the goal. Um, it's been interesting getting to the point where I'm realizing I need to start hiring people <laughs> <laughs> to facilitate that. Sure. Which is really bizarre to me because it's like, fuck, I want to do everything myself because yeah. I trust myself better than I trust anybody else. Yeah. But then realizing like the thing I just keep bouncing around in my head for really the past couple of months, it's like, fuck, there aren't enough hours in the day. <laughs> just for me to like get everything done I need to do, mm -hmm. there aren't. So now I was like, God, do I need to get an intern? Do I have to, you know, now open my life up to somebody else being in my house? Sure. Like this is this is a issue I've never had before in my life and I'm still grappling with how to handle that. 
It was almost like before in your career, everyone always told you, oh, you need to build a whole team, you need a management. And maybe at that point, you didn't necessarily need it because you, you could handle it still. But now you're actually finding yourself at a point where there's so much going on that you might actually need some assistance. And it's, well, it's, it's a weird thing because it's not like I'm not making crazy money doing this or anything like that. You know, it's a lot of just work for the sake of work. But now I find <laughs> I have to be the boss. And that is, I mean, I love being the boss. That, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But I think it's just opening up my own personal space to having other people around, at least, you know, on a trust work. level, I guess. Or? No, no, it's not a trust level at all. It's, it's knowing that somebody's in this room, yeah. you know, in this room in my house where why I'll, I'd be in the studio working on whatever. And that's weird to me. Like I, I like my own space, and yeah. I'm not really I'm not really an introvert, you know. I'm actually really extroverted, but which is evident when I drink. But, um, but I really need my own space. That's why I have my own little house and my own my own world, and inviting inviting someone into that is really hard for me. So I want to know more about what's coming up next. Um, you've mentioned possibly starting a new moniker and dividing your projects more into Matt Lang for the more experimental and industrial side, and then um, maybe using Isorhythm for more club or techno releases. Yeah, techno record too. Yeah, I, I'd love to more, know more about that division. Um, I guess when it might start taking shape. Um, anything you want to say on it? I would say the next... The next club release will be an Ice Rhythm record or an Ice Rhythm EP um, because that's almost done. And um, there, there will be one more, certainly another Mousetrap Matt Lang track, I believe, on their next compilation. But um, that's kind of it's its own entity. It'll take care of itself, and ideally, it'll keep me playing gigs and touring and all that. Then on this side of things, since we're holding microphones, yeah, I mean, doing this podcast is every week right now. Yeah, and I foolishly thought, oh, I'll just get, I'll talk to my friends. We'll get to drink beer together, and you know, it'll be fun. Yeah. And you know, realizing how much work actually goes into it, and it's a lot. Like this is what I need to get an intern for, but I can't sure. because I can't have an intern record for me. You know, yeah, yeah, you like, gotta be I have on to the do podcast. it. Yeah. So. Um, that's been a transition in my career, trying to balance that, okay. and then the coordination side of that of you know getting people to come down and actually do the thing and and i I've realized like the only thing that's stopping people from coming is me, yeah, because I just I get self conscious about it. And it's like uh, about, he, about reaching out. Yeah, they're gonna yeah. say no, or they're gonna. Oh, that's yeah. awkward, or you know, whatever. It's stupid because yeah. the minute I do, then people are really excited to do it. Yeah, and that that really blows me away. Like I don't. Why is that? Well, there are two sides of it. Every artist likes to talk about themselves. <laughs> True. Like that is you know, case in point. We love it. Um, but maybe because I like to, it's hard. It's been harder for me to guide interviews because I'm used to being on the other side of it. Sure, I'm used to being the subject, so being the interviewer is certainly more challenging for me. It's um, it's a new chapter, and it's something I've been getting better at, and. The first couple of episodes, like after we recorded them, I had to do so much editing on, yeah, just to make them, you know, <laughs> yeah, not sound goofy, and because I was awkward about it and very unsure of myself and everything like that, and I feel like I'm better at it now, and that was that's a lot of time, you know, it's just it's a learning experience, but I like it, it's fun, and the response has been really. Positive, which is nice, and not not necessarily what I expected. I didn't know what to expect. I just did it. 
but that's been good. And then, um, then I'm just working on Calliope, and that's you know that's the thing that's always ticking in the back of my brain. Like, get off your ass and fucking do it, asshole. <laughs> that, that it's like it's the little gremlin with a fucking pickaxe, like just sure. hammering it in right in my cortex. And is that just your subconscious prodding you along, or what? What is that little gremlin? Oh, it's not subconscious. It's yeah. very conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's there because it's just you know what I need to do. And sure. And again, that is also that's my own fear of vulnerability. Yeah. And what's interesting about the next section of it is where minus Clever Girl, which Clever Girl is actually a rather fairly romantic song. I mean, that was, you know, that was a positive one, but the other two were not. Those were angry songs. Punish me. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Case in point. Um, but a lot of three out of the four tracks of the next one are overwhelmingly positive. Really? Is that a reflection of your mental state then you think? Just the the kind of new structure you've found? It's a reflection of that, which um ultimately has morphed itself into the people I've met or my relationships, I should say, because I'm in a better place. I suppose who I invite into my life is also better. So yeah, it's interesting as opposed to, you know, feeling sorry for yourself and look at what you did to me. Sure. Which is what a lot of the last one was. Now this is a lot more outwardly hopeful and romantic. Interesting. And I feel weird about that. Yeah. I, I, that's not. Is that why you're afraid to work on it? You think because probably that vulnerability. I, I'm sure of it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it's yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's it's a new feeling for me because it's my ex used to get down on me all the time. It's like. I, you never write anything happy about me. Everything's about what I've done wrong, or you know, everything's sad. It's hard to write a happy song. It like, doesn't sound cheesy. I love too. sad bastard music. Yeah. Like that's what I thrive on. You know, like I find when I'm really inspired is when I'm miserable. Yeah. If I'm happy, I'm not inspired. I'm just happy. <laughs> you're not in the studio. You're just out skateboarding. <laughs> right. 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 Like you know, yeah. or like taking someone out, or like yeah. buying, just doing stupid shit. You know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that that's a battle for me, man. That's really that's challenging, and that's something I'm just forcing myself to, you know, push myself out of my own way and just do it. Sure. So that's that's what's next. That's what you know. The next really three weeks are all going to be. I mean, assuming nothing else gets in the way, and something probably will because something always does. But. Um, Ideally, yeah, I'm trying to finish this one so then I can hopefully get it out in October. And I think realistically then the full album's just going to come after that because then that'll be seven tracks. And my tracks aren't short. No, I was going to ask a lot of, especially your club records are often eight to nine minutes. And ten now. Ten. Um, <laughs> yeah, so thankfully they're not club records because yeah. I could fit about six of them on a yeah. record. But uh, I am doing vinyl, so I have to take into account just the sheer limitations of physical limitations. Yeah, the physical yeah, limitations sure. of how much time you can put on a vinyl record. Okay. So if every track of mine averages at six to seven minutes long, I can't put more than eleven on there. Yeah. And that's being generous. Sure. Well, maybe the limitations a good thing, though. It will almost um, force you to do more with less with oh, the yeah. time I you're mean, given. It, it becomes your own editor. Yeah, you have to be very, much more selective with the tracks you can include. Almost yep. raise your standards a little bit. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, it's good. Um, just to pull yourself out, you know, from uh, being right in the middle of it and seeing what it looks like from the outside. That uh, that's going to be an interesting experience because. I probably naively thought that I'll just, yeah, I'll write three tracks now, then that'll come out in March, then the next three tracks will come out in June, the next three tracks will come out in October, the next will be out in December, and the final record will come out then too. Yeah. And I'll be done. And I'm like, it's fucking July, or no, it's August, shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's August, and one of them's come out, I'm still, you know, 
halfway through the next one, I mean, nothing ever goes according to plan. No. <laughs> so, and as opposed to promising, you know, it's going to be done then because that's not fair to yourself. That's not fair to your art. It has to be done when it's done, not because a fan base is telling you it needs to be done. They'll wait. Sure. So is that where you stand on deadlines almost? Do you like do you ever impose your own deadlines or more to your recent point, do you kind of just work and when it when it's done, it's done? Or do you see the value in kinda having this arbitrary date where you know you must ship it by? Well, when it's someone else's deadline, you'll meet it. Yeah. When it's your own, it's flexible. It's good to set it just so you have that goal to work towards. But if you get to that deadline and you know it's not where it's supposed to be, that deadline goes away. You could say, okay, it'll be next week now, but it's the endless. No, you just keep working at it and it's going to be done when it's done. When it's a deadline for somebody else, you might hit that deadline and that's as far as you got. And then that's what you give them because that's as far as you got. But when it's your own personal work, I mean, you're your own worst enemy, so you're gonna, you know, grind your fingers down to the nubs, and you know, you just do it because you have to. So that was my chat with Michael Sundius of Billboard, Dancing Astronaut, and Mousetrap. Usually, I'd say something about the guest, but since the guest was me, I don't feel that's necessary. But thank you again, Mike. This was a pleasure, and. Interesting always to listen back to yourself. So that all said, have a great week.